They reappeared when mankind entered the atomic age. Two years after the Hiroshima bombing on June 24, 1947, Kenneth Arnold, the private pilot, reported his sighting of nine glittering objects flying in formation round Mount Rainer in Washington State. He described them as looking like flying saucers. The greatest myth of the 20th century was born, and reports from all around the country caused the U.S. Army and Air Force to deal with the mystery. The first UFO tracking project was installed in Alaska because they assumed that the strange flying objects entered the Earth's atmosphere through the polar regions. The U.S. Army Air Force Intelligence ordered a special team of highly qualified technicians to install the most sophisticated equipment aboard their B-29s reconnaissance planes to retrieve the best possible data on the UFOs. They used magnetic field detectors, radio frequency emission scanners, and 16 millimeter film cameras, or so-called gun cams, installed instead of the guns. Also, the pilots were equipped with eight, 16, and 35 millimeter hand cameras, also press cameras, including 8x10 Fairchilds, the most precise camera of that time, using 8x10 inch wide negatives. The project was placed under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Wendell C. Stevens of the Foreign Technology Command of the Air Material Command posted to Alaska for this mission. And my job was to supervise the team that installed this equipment and it was also to brief the crews before they departed on their mission and tell them what kind of equipment they had aboard and how to use it and what to look for. And then each time they came back they were debriefed by their operations people and then they were turned over to me to debrief on the special applications, the, the, the classified section of the mission which I was supervising and that pertained to the possible encounter of anything unusual over the Arctic and sometimes they came back with interesting reports. Uh, I heard in the debriefings I heard statements and I copied them and sent them forward to Washington describing objects that approached the bombers head-on stopped in midair and picked up reverse to the same speed the bomber was flying and it would remain in a formation position on the bomber for minutes and then fly away. They reported seeing aircraft or flying objects in the sky that were flying ten times as fast as the B-29s could fly. They reported seeing objects that stopped in the air right next to the B-29, took a position with it and stayed there for minutes. I remember one report where an object got in behind the trailing edge of the large wing and ahead of the smaller wing in the position, open position there and remained for two or three minutes and they got pictures with all of the movie cameras and the handheld cameras including the 8x10 Fairchild camera of this object in position right alongside of the B-29. All of the data that was recorded by this special equipment, the cartridges, cassettes, rolls of film and everything, after a mission with an encounter was removed from the canisters and the equipment items and packed in a metal box and chained to an officer's wrist and flown to Washington that night. And this happened on a frequency of about three or four times a month for the whole year and a half that I was doing this in Alaska. How did the pilots describe these objects? Well, we had pilots describe the objects as being disc-shaped in form, completely different from any known aeronautical configuration. And they saw them in the air. <coughs> they also saw them above them and below them. They saw them sitting on the ice pack in the snow. <clears throat> and this was remarkable because we required a great deal of support equipment to launch the B-29s. Heaters, gasoline trucks, many things. And here are objects sitting on the ice pack that don't have any support equipment at all visible. Nothing. They're the, they arrived and landed and apparently can take off. We saw them take off, pilots saw them take off from this ice pack and fly away. They saw them land on the water and submerge and disappear. Others saw them come to the surface, rise out of the water and fly away. 
And all of these things clearly exceeded all known technological developments in the world of that time, in 1947. These reports gave the Air Material Command forerunner of the Air Technical Intelligence Center of the U.S. Air Force a precise impression of the UFO phenomena quite early. On September 23, 1947, the former Air Force Chief of Staff and the AMC Commander General Nathan F. Twining wrote this report to the Commanding General of the U.S. Air Force in Washington, D.C., classified top secret. The phenomenon is something real and not visionary or fictitious. There are objects approximating the shape of a disk of such appreciable size as to appear to be as large as man-made craft. As filmed in May 1964 by Dr. Daniel Fry, a rocket engineer from Maryland, Oregon, the reported operating characteristics such as extreme rates of climb, maneuverability and action lend belief to the possibility that some of the objects are controlled either manually, automatically or or here, here, an Australian TV team on December 31st, 1978. Clearly, we see a luminous dome, a rim around the center and big portholes. It maneuvered in such an incredible speed that it left this track on just a single picture of the film. No terrestrial aircraft is able to fly in such a pattern, obviously defying the laws of gravity. Obviously, General Twining was impressed by this. Extreme maneuverability, particularly in role and action, which must be considered evasive when sighted or contacted by friendly aircraft. As filmed in 1966 by the Oldfields, a British couple flying over central England, here again in slow motion, the Zeppelin-shaped UFO performed U-turns in a third of a second. No terrestrial aircraft could do this. The apparent common description of these objects is as follows. Circular or elliptical in shape, flat on the bottom and domed on top. As here on a film taken by a TV crew from New Zealand on January 2nd, 1979. Here we see the rotating disc from the top. Getting closer, we recognize clearly two stores. The objects resemble this UFO photographed by a Brazilian journalist in 1952 at the beach of Rio de Janeiro. Here, the dome is visible from the side, surrounded by some kind of portholes. This sensational series of pictures of a dome-shaped UFO was taken by the mechanic Paul Villa on June 16, 1963, near Albuquerque, New Mexico. Here, the metallic reflecting dome is surrounded by a whitish force field. Villa, who claimed to be in contact with extraterrestrials, shot a second series of pictures on April 18, 1965.